So as you all know, the, in the effect of incentives on work decisions is a central question in public and labor, and the effect of pensions on work decisions is a key context for studying that question. We're going to study Social Security, which, as um, you know, is, uh, is the single largest uh, U.S. federal program with uh, almost $800 billion <coughs> in annual spending, and it's around 20% 20, 20 of total U.S. federal spending. So Social Security, of course, could be a major determinant of elderly work decisions in the U.S. There are sort of uh, suggestive correlations over time. The elderly employment rate fell from around 27% in 1950 to about 11% by 1985. And over that period, Social Security benefits uh, grew quite a bit from around $5,000 on average to around $12,000. And the replacement rate also uh, more than doubled. And so maybe those are related. It's certainly been hypothesized many times. Um, but those correlations over time could be, of course, confounded by other factors that are changing over time. And so we're going to turn to the micro data to estimate effects on social of Social Security on work decisions. Specifically, we're going to revisit the notch, um, so-called notch that was created by the 1977 Social Security Amendments, which cut uh, lifetime discounted average uh, benefits by about six $6,100 for people born in 1917 relative to those born in 1916, and also greatly in reduced the net incentive to earn for those in the 1917 cohort relative to 1916. And this has often been seen in previous literature as one of the cleanest settings for studying the effects of pensions or Social Security. Um, <clears throat> so the key empirical strategy that we're going to take advantage of is that each birth cohort year can face its own Social Security benefit schedule. Those born, so those born on or after January 2nd, 1917, face sharply different Social Security benefits than those born before this date. And so we're going to use a regression discontinuity design and compare otherwise similar people who have sharply different Social Security benefits because they're born effectively one day earlier or later. And the reason, this is a long time ago, obviously, um, you know, we're interested in what Social Security is like today as well, but the reason we study this is that it, it's the largest sort of discontinuous change, you know, um, affecting some people very sharply different than other people um, in Social Security benefits um, of its kind. So we're going to use Social Security data on about 25 million, <coughs> uh, with a, about, about 25 million observations on about 725,000 people. And we're going to look at whether that change in policy causes a discontinuity in earnings, um, as well as in the probability of positive earnings, which we'll think of as participation. And we're going to show you that there's no discontinuity in outcomes in various placebo samples. This is all in the, in the paper. Um, and that that's these, our results are robust to a variety of different uh, specification checks. <clears throat> so where do we see this fitting into the large previous literature on um, and, and well-developed literature on uh, pensions and on Social Security uh, more generally. We think that this variation is uh, more generally useful in understanding the determinants of earnings decisions of the elderly and the effects of pensions and Social Security because it's a setting with uh, large and very clean variation, I'll argue. Um, and the 1977 amendments, we think, are also important to understand in their own right because they're one of the major historical changes in Social Security policy with the potential to uh, cause substantial changes in work behavior, as I will uh, argue later. So of course, this is going to follow a large body of existing work on Social Security and other pensions. And Gruber and Wise conclude uh, from their edited volumes um, from the US and around the world that um, Social Security often reduces the incentive to work and therefore reduces work substantially. Our most salient new finding is going to be clear and very large income effects of, on, on earnings in a modern elderly pension program. Others have found uh, effects for, uh, income effects in Social Security um, uh, usually of more modest uh, size. Um, there's, there's evidence that there were large income effects uh, well earlier in U.S. history um, and some evidence of, and evidence of, of large inheritance wealth effects. Um, so that's sort of where we see it fitting into the literature. And under further assumptions, we find that substitution elasticities are at most small, at least in our context, where the, the variation, we think, isn't particularly salient to, uh, to retirees or, or others um, in general. And so that contrasts with the evidence from Gruber and Wise that substitution effects are, uh, are relatively important. Kruger and Pischke um, started the economics literature on the notch, and um, they, they innovated this. Um, <clears throat> they used cu current population survey, survey data, 
and um, variation across birth years in Social Security benefits and labor force participation. And they find that uh, there wasn't evidence that the, the change in benefits affected elderly male labor force participation. They don't explicitly look at earnings impacts, which is our main focus. So we're going to use different data and a different identification strategy. We're going to use data on the full US population, both men and women regression discontinuity design that I described earlier briefly. Um, we're gonna come to seemingly divergent conclusions for men. Um, we're, finding, we're finding, we will find a moderate participation response that corresponds to very large changes in earnings, but we're gonna show that when you use a similar specification and sample in our data, we estimate actually similar results uh, to theirs. So our view is basically that their study was executed as well as possible um, given the data, um, but it was ultimately underpowered to find the, uh, the uh, effects that we find at least when they look at the participation outcome. <coughs> um, there's only a modest effect in our data. Okay, so as you all know, Social Security uh, retirement, uh, early retirement age is 62. In these cohorts that we study, 1916 and 17, normal retirement age is 65. Social Security benefit is based on the primary insurance amount, or PIA, and prior to the 1977 amendments, the PIA was an, average, was an increasing and generally progressive function of the average monthly wage. AMW, which was calculated as mean nominal uh, monthly earnings in the highest earning years with no indexation of earnings for inflation. The 1972 Social Security amendments indexed the PIA to the consumer price index, CPI, which is sometimes called double indexation. And so PIA was adjusted according to the CPI in every year. And so what that meant was there were two factors that were increasing the PIA. First, there was the direct impact of CPI that I just described. And second, the PIA depended on the AMW average monthly wage, which in turn mechanically, uh, which obviously increased when inflation increased earnings. And so in the high inflation uh, late 1970s, that, or in the high, high inflation 1970s, that led to a sharp increase in Social Security benefits over time. And the 1977 amendments were, were <coughs> um, intended to address that fast benefit growth. It was just to fix the timing. It was signed into law on December 20th of 1977. And looking at the legislative history, it appears that the date of birth discontinuity could not have been anticipated with confidence until earlier in 1977. So what that did was it created the social security system that we, that we know now in the sense that um, PIA depends on AIME, average index monthly earnings, which is wages indexed for wage growth. Um, hmm, this stopped working, all right. And um, for the 1917 to 21 cohorts, it created, they were sort of these transitional cohorts, and it created what was called the transitional guarantee, and it gave beneficiaries the greater of either benefits based on the AAME formula or benefits based on a modified AMW formula. Um, it was modified in a number of ways. I'm going to focus on the first of these to simplify your lives because that's the only one that affects the uh, discontinuity that we we study, which is that earnings in calendar years after someone hits age 61 were no longer used um, to calculate AMW for the purposes of this transitional guarantee. And the majority of the 1917 cohort um, was covered under the modified AMW formula, or at least more people were covered under the modified AMW formula than the AIME formula. And so that created two effects potentially on earnings. One is the income effect some years after hitting age 61 that otherwise would have been counted in the highest earning years were no longer going to be counted in the highest earning years. And so average AMWs uh, were, are fall as a result of this policy change, therefore bringing down um, average Social Security benefits. There's also a substitution effect. If you earn more in the 1917 cohort in years after hitting age 61, it no longer raises your benefit, and so there's a substantially smaller incentive to earn in the 1917 relative to the 1916 cohort. And it turns out that this was actually a large substitution effect as well, an average 21% decrease in the net returns to earnings in 19, the 1917 cohort relative to 1916. So, um, <clears throat> so we're going to use Social Security administrative data on the universe of US earnings records in these two cohorts um, with a complete uh, FICA earnings history starting in 1951. And we're gonna observe earnings, date of birth, social security. We're gonna calculate social security benefits on the basis of many uh, social security rules, although we don't, we don't get quite all of them, but um, we, we think we, we, we hopefully capture the most important ones and, um, <clears throat> uh, and uh, as well as the month that claiming uh, began. 
So our key outcomes um, are going to be earnings and participation. Our main focus is going to be on earnings because it can be relevant to effects on the government budget, which we're going to estimate, as well as welfare. And we're going to define participation in a given year as, um, as whether someone has uh, positive earnings. And it's standard at this point, I think, to focus on earnings rather than hours worked <coughs> in some of, these, uh, some of these labor supply studies. So um, just so you know how our data is defined, after death, earnings and participation are set to zero. Everything is in 2012 terms and some other uh, kind of uh, restrictions, which I won't go over in the interest of time. So um, the bandwidth selected by the Kalanico et al. procedure is 56 days. Um, our figures are going to show sev seven 10-day bins uh, of data around the 1916-17 discontinuity. We're going to pool men and women for our main analysis, although we separately investigate men and women, including in a, in a forthcoming uh, edited volume. Okay, so this is basically a graph of the first stage, and you can see that average benefits uh, at the 1917 cohort fell by around $6,000. We need to also show for the validity of the regression discontinuity design, that uh, other outcomes are relatively smooth through the boundary. This is the number, this is essentially like a graphical version of the McCrary test, so it shows that the number of individuals is relatively smooth through the boundary, and so are other, discon uh, so are other um, uh, demographics like uh, fraction white and fraction male, and those are all insignificant. <clears throat> um, so this is basically our main graph. What it shows is that there's an increase of about $4,000, just visually looking at it, um, in the 1917 cohort relative to the 1916 cohort in discounted lifetime earnings uh, from 1978, the year after the reform, to uh, 2012. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a sort of regression version of that where we have discounted earnings, discounted lifetime earnings over the remaining years. Uh, in On the left-hand side, we have a discontinuity uh, for the cohort boundary between 1916 and 17 uh, on the right-hand side. And so we're going to estimate our key coefficient of interest is going to be this beta 1, the coefficient on that, and then a linear spline uh, in date of birth. And we're, this is just going to document the magnitude and statistical significance of the jump uh, in earnings. And what you can see is that there's a statistically significant increase throughout all of, so on the, on the x-axis is the bandwidth, and on the y-axis is the coefficient and the confidence interval, and you can see that there's a statistically significant jump at the boundary across all of the um, different bandwidths. At the Kalanico et al. bandwidth, um, the jump is around uh, $37.66 of lifetime discounted earnings. When we look at the probability of positive earnings in every year from 1978 to 2012, which um, is ages 61 to 95 in the data, it appears to jump by around 0.4 uh, percentage points. And the intensive margin response, the implied intensive margin response, um, is positive and significant, but there's sort of a selection, classic selection problem that, um, that confounds the interpretation of that. Okay, um, <clears throat> when we look at when the effects show up, we find no effect prior to the reform, which is what you would expect, um, this sort of placebo test in some sense. Um, in 1978 to 1980, the first three years after the reform, we find insignificant effects, and we find an insignificant effect in 1978, in particular, something that I'll come back to. And then we find that the effects rise to a maximum in people's mid to late 60s and then fall to insignificant by the time uh, they get to be very old in the, in the later years. And we find similar, a similar pattern um, of effects on participation peaking slightly later in the late, uh, late 60s and early 70s. And in the paper, I'm not going to belabor it in the interest of time, but we show that various robustness checks, the co various sort of placebo checks, coefficient is maximized at the actual cohort boundary rather than placebo cohort boundaries. The effects don't show up in other cohort boundaries um, to the same extent, um, and uh, they don't show up in Social Security uh, prior to the Social Security eligible ages, as I already showed you um, uh, for certain years. So um, <clears throat> next we're going to analyze sort of income and substitution effects. Our results so far show that um, the income effect in some sense outweighs the substitution effect in the sense that if leisure is a normal good, you cut benefits, and so um, if leisure is a normal good, people should, um, should work more and earn more in the 1917 cohort. The substitution effect pushes in the opposite direction, 
Um, substitution effects have to be positive, so if you cut the incentive to earn in the 1917 cohort, it means people should earn less. And so it's, it's clear that the income effect outweighs the substitution effect in the sense that we find an increase in earnings at the cohort boundary um, when you go to 1917. To go further, you need um, a framework, and so we're going to start with a simple life cycle framework, a standard McCurdy framework studying the determination of um, earnings rather than hours worked. We're going to think of this as sort of an illustrative benchmark, but we're going to think of alternative uh, frameworks later. So it's a standard utility maximizing framework subject to an intertemporal budget constraint, and in that framework, um, you can express uh, earnings as a function of the marginal utility of lifetime wealth, the incentive to earn in any given year, and various observe, observable and unobservable uh, characteristics. <clears throat> and so if we uh, linearize this, um, we can express expected earnings as a function of social security benefits as well as the incentive to earn in any given year. Um, and so what we are going to do is that we're going to estimate a two-stage least squares regression where we're going to use the cohort boundary as an instrument for, uh, for benefits in a two-stage least squares regression where the dependent variable of interest is um, discounted lifetime earnings. And the idea here is that since the substitution effect is weakly positive, this is going to estimate a lower bound, a weak lower bound on the income effect. Um, and so our central finding of the paper is going to be that because the lower bound is, is quite large, income effects um, by implication have to be uh, large. So what we find is that for a dollar increase in lifetime discounted Social Security benefits, there's a decrease in lifetime discounted earnings of around 61 cents. And um, for a $10,000 increase in lifetime discounted Social Security benefits, there's a decrease in the percent, there's a 0.65 dis, um, percentage point decrease in the percent of years with positive earnings. And we look at various robustness checks uh, in the paper, which I won't describe in the interest of time. We, find we also find larger estimates for women relative to men and larger point estimates for uh, lower income individuals relative to higher income. So under further assumptions, we can estimate a substitution elasticity. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to linearize uh, this earnings equation, determination equation further. And basically, the um, idea behind this is that after the 1977 reform, um, the marginal utility of wealth could have been anticipated uh, for everyone. And so in a standard McCurdy framework, that gets that impacts earnings immediately in 1978 once the um, impact is anticipated. Um, whereas the only thing that's varying between 1978 and 1979 is the incentive to earn more because the substitution incentive only starts in years after individuals hit 61. And um, for individuals in the 1917 cohort, uh, that happened in 1979. So what we're going to do is set up these um, these earnings determination equations in both 78 and 79, if we subtract them, this, and we assume that the marginal utility of lifetime wealth is constant through 1978 and 1979 under the rationale that I just mentioned, um, that difference is out. And so what you're left with is that the difference in earnings between 78 and 79 should be proportional to the difference in the substitution incentive. And so basically what we're going to do is a difference in discontinuity design where in 1978, um, the substitution incentive mu, like in, in other words, the increase in Social Security benefits from an, inc from an increase in, uh, in earnings, it's constant be or is, is smooth through the 1916 and 1917 cohort boundary, whereas in 1979, it discontinuously changes um, to zero for the 1917 cohort for those on this transitional AMW formula. And so we're going to basically difference out the discontinuities in these two years. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is for each, um, for each date of birth near this cohort boundary, we're going to calculate the difference in earnings between 1978 and 1979. And if there's a substitution effect, then this should uh, decrease discontinuously. This difference in earnings should decrease discontinuously at the cohort boundary. And just to so you understand um, this should how, how big this should be. 
if there's sort of a moderate substitution elasticity of say 0.25, it should cause actually a very large discontinuity in the difference in earnings between 78 and 79 of around $900. And that's because the substitution incentive is changing by um, fully 21% between the 16 and 17 cohort starting in 1979. In fact, we don't see a, a, sh a sharp decrease in earnings in 1979. And um, so what we can do is do the sort of regression-based version of that graph where we use, again, the cohort boundary, in this case, to instrument for the difference in substitution incentives between 78 and 79. Um, <clears throat> and then this, the second stage is the change, regressing the change in earnings on that instrumented change in the substitution incentive. And what we find is that there are um, insignificant substitution effects, at least in this uh, context, um, and we can bound the, um, the earnings effect at not, uh, the, the earnings, the elasticity of earnings at not more than 0 0.01, which is obviously very small, and the participation elasticity at not more than 0 0.05 in terms of what the 95% confidence interval implies. So, <clears throat> so that's sort of what you get in a life cycle framework. You can also think about you know, a model with sort of myopia or uh, liquidity constraints. Um, and our, our estimates are actually consistent with this because in that model, um, ben earnings in a given year should depend on your benefits in that year, or the discontinuity in benefits should determine the discontinuity in earnings. And um, that's consistent with our model because we find insignificant effects in the late 1970s, including in 1978, before, um, uh, uh, including in 1978, when there's no discontinuity in earnings. It only actually starts showing up in 19. Uh, 79. So um, now we don't think really that it's probably liquidity effects because most of these individuals have some assets and moreover for nearly everyone their incomes are falling so they shouldn't actually want to borrow um, in a you know sort of standard basic life cycle model. But our results are consistent with sort of myopia or learning about benefits through experience. Um, and that myopia hypothesis is also consistent with the fact that we don't measure a substitution effect because for a substitution effect to happen, you would have to, number one, know about the impact of current earnings on future benefits, and number two, um, think about the future. Um, <clears throat> and you can see that here that in 1978 to 1980, there's very little discontinuity in benefits received, and the reason is that number one, not that many people are claiming, and number two, the effect of the policy on your benefits increased over time because you needed more years of earnings to accumulate that were disallowed under the transitional AMW formula that wouldn't that would have been allowed under the traditional AMW for, under the traditional AMW formula for the discontinuity and benefits to get really big. So the discontinuity and benefits actually mirror it sort of has this uh, U-shape um, which and it's maximized in sort of the mid-1980s when you find the biggest effects on participation. Okay, so you can set up a regression um, where earnings or benefits depend, where um, we're using the cohort boundary to instrument for benefits in a given year, and we're uh, regressing earnings in that contemporaneous year on benefits in that year. And um, what you get is that um, the point estimates are declining over time, and pooling all years, we find that a dollar increase in benefits causes a 46 cent decrease uh, in contemporaneous earnings, and a $1,000 increase in annual benefits causes a 1.31 percentage point decrease in um, contemporaneous probability of working. When we run similar specifications to Kruger and Pischke, um, we basically find similar results that are actually insignificantly different than theirs when we use essentially their, their, uh, their strategy, um, their, their strategy with um, benefits aggregated to the year, uh, to the uh, cohort and year level. Um, and so what we conclude is that the, the cross cohort empirical design is basically underpowered to um, separate the true effect from unrelated cross cohort variation. And so even though um, we're, so we're basically finding just a moderate impact on participation, and it turns out that that's insignificantly different from the effect uh, that, they, uh, that they estimate. So even with our RDD, we're finding an insignificantly different effect on participation, which is modest, but because, participate, because not participating rather than participating can entail a large difference in earnings, it actually corresponds to very large 
earnings crowd out. So again, we conclude their data was, uh, their, their strategy was executed well given their data, um, but ultimately uh, doesn't pick up this, uh, this effect that, that we estimate. So um, under some assumptions, we can count, you know, assuming that our estimates, which is a big assumption, I'll flag that, uh, are applicable elsewhere, we can calculate the effect of changing social security benefits on, uh, for the government budget. So assuming a 25% federal marginal tax rate, a $1 decrease in social security benefits would save the government $1.12 on net in the static model. Um, the social security trust fund, social security and disability trust fund would save $1.06. Um, and uh, that would obviously decrease the amount of benefit cuts if you're gonna close the 75 year actuarial gap through benefit cuts alone, it would decrease um, the benefits cuts necessary to do that uh, quite a bit. Um, and also, you can simulate other things like a one -year un the effect of a one-year unanticipated change um, in the na normal retirement age, which causes a increase in uh, lifetime earnings around uh, $2,700 for average benefits. You can also use this to come back to some of the time series patterns that we talked about earlier. Um, as I mentioned, um, as I'm sure you know, Social Security benefits increased a lot through the 20th century. Um, elderly employment rates fell quite a bit. And so we can calculate how much of this decrease uh, can be accounted for through the increase in benefits. And it turns out that it's um, a little more than half in the general population. Um, of course, this is subject to numerous caveats, like the fact that, um, that these estimates are local, um, there could be spousal interactions and all kinds of other things that we, uh, that we don't think about. But in any case, we think that that's um, illustrative of the, the potential implications. Um, we think that this episode, as I said, is interesting on its own, but we don't think that it implies that substitution effects are always small. In this particular context, you have to have a fairly sophisticated understanding of the link between current earnings and lifetime benefits to understand substitution incentives. So even though people have found effects on social substitu um, substitution effects in other contexts, and we think that the, that's, that's good work, we think that that's right, what this does demonstrate is that when, um, in this context, they're small, and that may be because um, the policy is not particularly uh, easy to understand. They, of course, don't imply that income effects are very large in all contexts, um, uh, but we think that this is, that this is uh, still interesting and, uh, and, uh, and certainly raises the, the, the possibility that, they're, um, <clears throat> that, they're, they're, uh, that they can be large. And that sort of pattern of large income effects and small substitution effects contrasts with the Gruber and Wise evidence that I mentioned earlier. So that's all that I have, and I will just turn it over to, to Gopi. Great. Um, thanks, everyone. Thanks to John for inviting me to discuss this paper and um, to the Sloan Foundation for supporting this conference, which has um, been an annual tradition here at CEPR and uh, is one I always look forward to. So um, those of you who are familiar with Alex's work know that a common thread in his work is that he does very careful empirical analysis on important policy questions using a very clean identification strategy, which made this paper a pleasure to read, but also a very hard one to discuss as a discussion because it's hard to sort of think of, um, you know, additional comments and suggestions to offer the authors. Um, and I know many of you are sort of probably familiar with the notch and previous work that uses the Social Security notch to sort of identify effects of retirement income on different types of outcomes. Um, and, and I was too, I, in fact, I, I, I've written a paper that uses the notch um, to understand the effect of income on long-term care utilization. Um, but even so, I uh, was sort of found, found myself looking into some of the legislative history of the notch to really understand the source of identification used here and how it differs from previous work that Alex talked about, the Kruger and Pischke work in particular. And, and just to try to understand why the results vary and um, you know, what is really driving the source of identification. And so I hope you'll bear with me, but I'm gonna sort of try to you know, explain some of what I learned at the risk of boring you with uh, some legislative details. Um, so basically, this is not on. Okay, okay, no problem. 
Okay, so um, as many of you know, um, prior to 1972, Social Security benefits were increased for inflation on sort of an ad hoc basis. And in 1972, when an automatic benefit increase provision was added, it was done so in a way that was sort of unsustainable in the long run because it sort of doubly indexed benefits um, at a rate that became very apparent once inflation rates began to rise. And in 1972, when it was adopted, inflation rates were still relatively low. Um, the Social Security program had a positive actuarial balance. And um, when, when people were thinking about this provision and what impact it would have, they assumed an inflation rate of 2.75% and a wage growth rate of 5%. And under all these scenarios, it didn't really severely impact the actuarial imbalance. Um, but as soon as 1973, it was very clear that inflation would be higher than had been expected. And the 1974 trustees report um, revealed a, a, a large actuarial imbalance of about 3% of taxable payroll, implying that tax rates would have, would have to be increased by 27%. And this might sound a little bit familiar to those of you who are in the know about current trustees reports. Um, uh, estimates of the actuarial balance for Social Security. And so then the Senate Co Committee on Finance, as I understand, appointed a panel and that issued a report highlighting the role of both demographics and the 1972 benefit formula in driving this actuarial uh, deficit. And the Social Security Advisory Council recommended that um, one of the indexing mechanisms would be removed um, to, to make the program sort of sustainable. And by 1977, the program was facing severe short-range problems. And as, as Alex mentioned, the 1977 amendments were signed into law um, late that year on December 20th. And um, in particular, so this transitional guarantee was sort of meant to transition the program from the 1972 uh, change to the uh, 1977 amendments in such a way that wouldn't be so disruptive for retirees that were affected by, uh, by the change. And um, so what, the way that it worked is that you would compute benefits under the old and new system and give people the higher of the two with two um, caveats. One is that the old system benefit table would not be indexed further with inflation, so this limited one of the sources of growth and benefits. And, and also the second one, which became very important, is that the wages earned at age 62 or older would not be used in the old benefit formula. And from what I understand, this was sort of added pretty late in the game in the discussions about the 1977 amendments and how to sort of address this problem. And in, in such a way that I think that it wouldn't have really been anticipated in any way, especially not differentially by people on either side of Alex's cutoff in his analysis. Um, and and the, other, the other important factor here is that it didn't, this transitional guarantee did not apply to people born prior to 1917. And the way the Social Security um, decides what year you're born is actually based on um, birth dates before or after January 2nd. So this led to this big discontinuity between people who were born <laughs> just before January 2nd, 1917, and people who were born on January 2nd or, or later. And so again, it sort of, I don't know, just really highlights the fact that um, it would be, uh, it seems very reasonable to assume that people on either side of this, this birth, uh, birthday cutoff would not have differential ideas on how the, the system would be reformed um, to address this double indexing problem. Whereas if you use sort of a, a bigger set of dates, it might be um, it, the expectations of how that might affect you might be, might be somewhat different. Okay, so what that led to, and um, this is a, a figure that probably many of you are familiar with, um, but basically the um, run-up in benefits uh, in the, the middle portion between these two dotted lines represents the sort of increasing rapid increase in, in Social Security uh, replacement rates that occurred after the 1972 amendments. And then you see kind of a reduction in the replacement rates, the expected replacement rates after the 1977 amendments. And this is kind of what people refer to as the notch. Um, I also didn't know the kind of the genesis of the, the expression notch, but uh, it came from apparently uh, 
I think it was a Dear Abby um, column that sort of first referred to this as a notch. So anyway, um, just some kind of interesting institutional details um, that are relevant for this paper. So um, what Alex and his co-authors are able to do is sort of um, separately try and understand income and substitution effects, which is this, a key contribution of this paper. And, and basically, um, the income effects are driven by the fact that earnings after 61 are not used, and so your discounted lifetime benefits fell by about $6,000. Um, but there's also this change in the substitution incentives. So um, the net marginal returns to additional earnings after age 62 also fell considerably by about 21%, as he estimates in the paper. And, and so it's an empirical question of whether sort of the income effects or the substitution effects may dominate um, in this situation. And so what Alex and his co-authors find is that the net effect is about a $5,000 increase in discounted lifetime earnings, which suggests that the, the income effect that he identified is the one that dominates. And um, he, he's also able to put a lower bound on the income effect. He estimates that a $1 increase in benefits reduces mean discounted lifetime earnings by about 61 cents. And he also uses a difference in discontinuities framework to um, show that the substitution effect seems um, small and statistically insignificant. And a lot of these effects appear to be front-ended and not sort of you know, spread across the future lifetime, um, which he attributes to some uh, possibly due to myopia. And so when I went back to the Kruger and Pischke paper also and, and reread that carefully, um, you know, the, the, the paper is trying to do a very similar thing, um, but they're using a different source of identification. So they're also looking at the effect of the notch on labor force participation, self-reported retirement, and the number of weeks worked from the CPS using um, aggregated data at the cohort age level um, from the CPS. And after they control for age and year effects, they don't find any evidence that labor force participation changed, um, either with the level of Social Security wealth or with um, what they, they're using as kind of a proxy for the substitution uh, incentives changing um, as the growth in Social Security wealth that would be expected from working between age 62 and 65. And um, I, I think I'm going to use this to, for my students, um, this comparison between these two papers as a good reason why you don't say, I find no effect, but rather I find no evidence for an effect, because um, the, the estimates that um, are found in this paper, they can't really be rejected by the, previous, by the previous paper's confidence intervals. It's just that the previous paper was sort of under power to be able to estimate, uh, estimate a precise um, income effect here. OK, so um, the assumption in the Kruger-Pischke paper is really just that variation in the Social Security wealth and the growth in the Social Security wealth are due exclusively to differences among cohorts who are otherwise identical except for um, the benefit notch, while in this paper, the identification assumption is that any changes in earnings occurring in the absence of the notch reform would have occurred smoothly across the January 2nd, 1917 threshold. And so you can see how these assumptions are, are sort of, they're similar, but they're, they're subtly different in a way that allows, I think, a better sort of even more credible identification strategy in this paper. And, but the, the kind of the difference in conclusions is quite large if you kind of aggregate it all up. So in the, in the Kruger-Pischke paper, they find that the, um, the largest estimate that they find would imply that the growth in Social Security benefits can explain less than one-sixth of the decline in male labor force participation observed over that time period, which, um, as you saw in Alex's talk towards the end, under several assumptions that he caveated appropriately, they find that the increase in benefit levels can account for about 58% of the decrease in elderly participation around a similar time period. And, and you know, Alex talked uh, a bit about kind of why these results are so different. As he mentioned, a large part of it is just the difference in identification strategies. Um, but they're also looking at different outcomes. So um, 
the Kruger-Pischke paper is sort of limited to looking at these extensive margin um, uh, labor supply measures from surveys. Um, he didn't mention this, but also sort of the reference period of those extensive margin uh, labor supply indicators are also different than, um, than kind of, uh, they differ from outcome to outcome. Um, there's also a big difference in the level of variation. And there's also some, I don't think um, Alex focused on this, but there could also be some measurement error in the Kruger-Pischke results because um, they actually don't have birth cohort. Um, they have age at the time of survey, um, which then leads to some possibility that people are misclassified across different birth cohorts. And that could also be attenuating uh, the result downward. Okay, so I just have, a, I'm just going to end with a few um, small suggestions or extensions um, that the authors could perhaps think about. Um, the first one is a, a little bit unfair because I know that in the administrative data that um, Alex and his co-authors use that they don't have information about um, who's married to whom. Um, but I think it would be really interesting if um, the authors could find a way to sort of link this maybe to survey data or to census data to try and understand how spousal labor supply decisions change when one spouse's benefit levels change. And I think that would be um, an interesting contribution. Um, the other thing is the authors mentioned that, you know, there could be, you might be worried that if you're looking across the January 1st cutoff, um, because of differences in compulsory schooling laws that have been used in, in many empirical papers to try to identify um, the effects of schooling on earnings, for instance, um, you know, could that be driving some of the results? And as the authors appropriately point out, um, that would actually lead to, um, you know, per potentially lower earnings on the other side of the um, January 1st threshold. Um, but that led me to wonder just, um, I, and, and they mentioned that there's not sort of a corresponding difference when they look at other um, comparisons across the January 1st cutoff, but um, even in the maybe nine appendices in the back of the paper, I didn't see those particular ones. And so I was wondering if the effects could even be larger than those estimated. If you kind of take that into account, it might be hard to really nail down because of the, the power issues, even with such great data. And then I was wondering if the authors could do anything about heterogeneity at all in this context. So I know the blessing and the curse of administrative data is that you have a lot of great information, but not a lot of descriptive characteristics about people. But I wonder if there's any information about geographic location and anything about local labor market conditions that could maybe um, allow you to estimate some heterogeneity across different um, underlying economic conditions that could be an interesting extension or, or potentially a new paper. So um, I'm going to end there and allow some time for questions. So. I don't know whether Syl is talking about the original double X indexation mistake or whether he's talking about the subsequent one where uh, they, they created this unintended notch. The unintended notch. Uh, in the late 1980s, the Senate Finance Committee appointed another committee on which I sat to say, what should we do about the fact that we've got this big notch? And so I learned quite a bit about it, much of which I've forgotten. But uh, my understanding is you can actually read in the congressional testimony at the time that the notch was created, the warning of a former chief actuary of Social Security saying this could happen. The way to avoid doing it is to give people credit for all of their marginal new years of earnings that are exactly identical across cohorts. You just stop letting people accrue benefits under the old formula, and on the margin, they accrue it under the new formula. And Social Security looked at that, and they said there's no possible way with our computer systems that we could calculate, uh, we could do the complicated calculations necessary to implement that. And so as a result of having uh, something that probably costs one-tenth of one percent of Social Security's uh, budget, namely their computer system at the time, they, they rejected this advice. And uh, the result was in the decade of the 1980s, Congress received more letters from their constituents on this one topic than, all, than anything else. And so you can think of everything that the Congress did in the 1980s. This 
generated more uh, letter writing. Now, whether we can think about this one-time change and tease out of it the information needed to figure out the effect of Social Security on the era since 1940, I think is more doubtful. The income effect that we observe here, which seems to be quite reliable, right? So there, we, there is a big income effect in, in the, these results, but the income effect may be because there's something a beneficiary can do that might affect their decision of when to stop working. Uh, and that is they can find out what their benefit would be if they retire this year, right? So they, they know that one number. But under the conditions of the early 1980s, late 1970s, it would have been very, very difficult for anyone, including economists, uh, to predict what their benefit was going to be from retiring later. So that means the substitute, the, the, the the added incentive that people got to delay retirement if they were born in 1916 uh, would have been much more difficult to know. If instead we think of a, about a system in which there's the, these permanent features, not temporary transitional features, but permanent features, I think that there's more possibility that people could learn from the experiences of others about what these, so what these payoff uh, functions are going to look like and perhaps responded with some kind of a more long-term uh, uh, thought behind their decision. But the only thing that people could observe, I think at the time, was, well, how much will I get in monthly benefits if I retire right now? That was observable and that would create a difference between these two generations, in uh, these two birth cohorts, in a way that, that uh, this analysis uncovers. Jerry, just to be clear, what Sill, I think, has memos uh, in 1972 about the, that we've double indexed that are dated before the amendments were adopted. They could have been corrected, but they weren't. I just wanted to add some context because I was a young consulting actuary working in the private sector at that time. And I remember uh, excitingly calling my father, who was born on December 28th, 1916, and told him that he optimized his date of birth. And he said, really? And he had no clue as to why his birth date was optimal. And he had friends who were obviously born a few months later. They just had no clue. And I'm, I'm building on what Gary is saying, is that put yourself back in the context then. There was no internet. Um, there wasn't the intense focus on retirement as there is now. And so people at the time really didn't understand what was going on other than actuaries and other analysts. And it really wasn't, I think um, Gopi mentioned the Dear Abby letter. It was after the fact in the 1980s when it took a while for this to get out. And then the people who were born in 1917 and after said, I've been screwed. But it was after the fact. And they had actually already retired. And I really think that Congress just felt, you know, we can't do anything about it. They've already retired. We're not going to go back and, and do anything for them. And so it just took a lot longer for word to get out than in, in today's world when we have the internet and we have online calculators. At the time, you basically called Social Security and you called your pension office and you said, I'm retiring at age 65. What's my pension and what's my Social Security? And that was the process. And so there wasn't much debate about or analysis about do I retire now or later. People just retired, often at 65, because that was what was called normal. So I just want to give some context at the time as to people's behavior, and I think it influences what you're talking about. Okay, thanks. <laughs>